I'm Karen Lightman. I'm Executive Director of Metro 21 Smart Cities Institute here at Carnegie Mellon University. We are a strong partner uh, of the uh, Wilson E. Scott Institute, and we're really excited to be here a part of Energy Week. And it's my honor and delight to be introducing this panel. Um, let's see, our, our panel that's coming up is Managing Energy and Water Infrastructure. And I'm excited to be introducing the folks to my left, including Peter Frisk, who's going to be today, Fisk rather, who's going to be today's moderator. Peter is the Director of Water and Energy Resilience Research Institute at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. Um, he is the Director of WERRI, and his goal is to orient and align the water-related research programs to address critical gaps in reliability, efficiency, sustainability of water, water energy systems in California as well as the country. Um, then to his left is Hervé Bousson. I think I got it right, all right. We rehearsed this. He's Vice President and Process Engineering at uh, Veolia Water um, Solutions and Technologies. Since 2005, Hervé has served as the Vice President of Process Engineering, Solutions and Technologies, and he's a member of the Executive Committee of the company. And then to his left is Megan Motter, that rhymes with water. Um, she's Associate Professor, Civil and Environmental Engineering and, and Public Policy here at Carnegie Mellon University. Megan's research probes pathways for meeting water demand in a carbon-constrained world by optimizing policies, evaluating efficiency, and developing and modeling materials to maximize performance. And then to her right is Venki Sharma. He's the president and CEO of Aquatech. Venki has been at the helm of Aquatech for more than 20 years, so no longer a startup, right? Uh, and he's transforming it from a small regional manufacturer of industrial water treatment equipment to a leader in global water industry with a focus on solving water scarcity issues. Please join me in welcoming the panel, and Peter, take it away. Panelists, thanks very much for uh, coming out today. Uh, right when we were off stage, uh, Hervé, you said that you've been in R&D in water for essentially your whole career, but you said now is one of the most exciting times to be in water. Tell us why. Yeah, so I was in Canada in R&D, then in France. I was heading the R&D center for our company, and I came to the US, and, I, and I'm an R&D guy, in, uh, which sometimes my boss say you're too R&D. <laughs> I can assure you that I've seen a lot of innovations, but what I see today is the background innovations in material sciences, biotechnology, computer sciences, digital sciences is so exciting because we have a lot of things that our industry uh, will be able to use in the future. So when I see young kids in universities, not new, <laughs> uh, I, I really tell them you are lucky because uh, you're going to have a very interesting bright future. And water is no longer considered you know, a, a small thing. Every industry is seeing water as strategic. So it's a fantastic time. And Vinky. You now lead a company that is innovating in the water space. Um, I noticed in, in our, uh, our previous title, it was uh, titled Managing Energy and Water Infrastructure, but it said Managing Energy, Comma, and Water Infrastructure. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you see the emerging connections between water and energy, in particular with, with in Pennsylvania? Um, well, um, I think, is my mic working? Yes. Um, I think that um, um, energy and water historically and more so today are very intertwined and we call it the energy water nexus. Um, energy requires lots of water and treating water, whether it's for air pollution, whether it's for high purity, requires lots of energy. Um, in Marcellus Shale, as an example in Pennsylvania, um, energy extraction uh, for shale gas, shale oil uh, requires um, tremendous management of water, whether it be uh, for treating uh, and re uh, for the reuse of frac water or production brines, which um, ultimately are end of life type uh, water. Um, and so there's a lot of recycle and reuse treatment, and there's a lot of ultimately more advanced technology treatment emerging as um, 
a area and a market. You know, I don't like to call, you can't generate, uh, generalize Marcellus Shale. You really have micro markets that develop based on where the concentration of TDS is in a market. Why don't, why don't you define, well, I was, I was going to say TDS is total dissolved, total dissolved solids. solids. In other words, the amount of salt and dissolved things Correct. in the water. Correct. So typically, you know, southwestern Pennsylvania will have an average total dissolved solids level. It will have an average distance from disposal. And it will have uh, average water availability. And depending on all of those things, the need for advanced technology will, will happen, you know, the amount of brine production. So in other words, you have different flavors of water even across a single uh, producing area. We would call them micro markets. Micro markets, sure. micro. And, and then different environments around the United States will have different flavors of water as well. Absolutely. I mean, if you're in the Permian Basin, it's a water scarcity driven market. In uh, Pennsylvania, we're typically a disposal driven market or lack of disposal. So in power, Oil and gas is largely the same, and electron is the same no matter where you go, but in water things are very different. Megan, um, in Pennsylvania, what challenges do you see that, that gives for water infrastructure if the conditions and the uh, chemistries of water can be so variable? Yeah, so... Um, it's on. Okay. Um, as Venki was alluding to, in, in the produced water treatment space especially, um, there is quite a bit of variability, both spatially but also temporally, uh, which means that your treatment technologies need to respond um, to very, very different total dissolved solids concentrations over the lifespan of the well. Megan, why don't you explain a little bit about, so our audience is familiar with what happens when you're at the various stages in oil and gas, what types of water go in and how do they come out and how do they change, just briefly. Yeah, sure. Um, so when you are injecting uh, your uh, frac fluid, um, that may be a uh, freshwater source that's being used to suspend the propent um, and the chemicals that are used in the hydraulic fracturing operation. Um, or some of that water may actually be recycled, so we'll come back to that in just a second. Um, you also have formation water, or water that is present in the shale itself. And so after the fracturing operation actually happens, you get flowback water, um, the composition of which looks something like the composition of the water that you put down the well in the first place. Um, and then over time, it evolves to look much more like the water that's present in the formation itself. Um, these shales have a, a, a number of different um, minerals uh, that, that make up the rock, um, including large concentrations of clay sometimes, which have lots and lots of uh, ions in, sort of trapped in that clay layer. Um, and that is most likely the source of a lot of the high concentration um, dissolved solids that we see in the flow back water here in the Marcellus. It sounds like a terrible treatment challenge. And, and uh, in some respects, is, uh, is this putting new demands on the technology for water treatment? Hervé, uh, as leader in R&D in one of the largest and most sophisticated water technology companies in the world. How is that challenging the traditional water treatment systems? Yeah, I think, you know, we have best available technologies that have been established and sold for a long time. But when we treat this type of new waters, which change, like you were saying, Megan, definitely um, you really need to rethink your, your standard offering. You need to optimize it. You need to tweak it. What the customers want, what the industry wants is resilience, reliability, you know. Every day the plant is not running is, is very important. So uh, I think the way you design a plant for this type of application in Pennsylvania is different from what we have been using to do in other places. And truly we are learning also every day as you get confronted with the industry, you know, how to optimize this train. Um, yeah, you see a lot of uh, two types of technologies, I'll stop there, but you have uh, technologies that are implemented at the early stage of uh, fracking, which is very dispersed, small mobile units, you know, that's going to go. And then at some point when you start to do more and more and you have more flow, then you're going to start to see bigger plants. And the technologies we use are state-of-the-art technology, and you need evaporation, membranes, I mean, those are complex. So, so one of the things that a lot of people might not realize is that the volumes of water relative to the hydrocarbons you get. I'm trained as a geologist, but even I was surprised by the volume of water relative to oil that comes out of the ground, even in a quote unquote normal well. So many oil and gas companies really are in the water business, whether they like it or not. 
Venki, um, have you seen innovation from the oil and gas industry with respect to how they treat their water, or are they relying on us to solve all these problems for them? I think uh, the oil and gas producers are demanding uh, innovation from ourselves, Veolvia, and other players in the market. Um, they're demanding uh, technology innovation. They're de demanding um, business model innovation. Um, Hervé referred to mobility. Mo taking technology into mobile assets um, have be has become an important aspect. Um, one of the things as far as customers innovating themselves, uh, to your question, Peter, they have, you know, what we see emerging is really depending on the recipe that a, um, um, and, and this becomes fairly complex for a producer because he's thinking about how often he's going to have to re-stimulate and um, the, the well as well as his yields. And the more sophisticated producers are really demanding designer water, what we call designer water, a very specific recipe. And that's part of the innovation that's going on and that's demanding technology innovation from ourselves and others. So, so you have to sort of become the barista from hell. You've got an infinite variety of water coming in, and you've got to make an infinite variety of different flavored drinks going out. Well, keep in mind, most of the water we deal with is three or four times more concentrated than seawater. So, so seawater is, is typically around 35,000 right. uh, TDS, total dissolved solids. And we're dealing with 140,000 on average TDS. So it's totally different than the industrial It's the worst of the Dead Sea. Hervé and me are used to. Yeah. Right. And you have to purify that. Do you have to purify that to drinking water standards? That sounds like a very complicated and, and, uh, and, and it, perhaps insurmountable task. The outcome is drinking water standards because of the technologies deployed, membranes, evaporation, eventually yield drinking water standards. Um, you don't, the, the producers don't require it. It's an outcome of what processes are demanded by the situation. So, so wait a minute, so we don't necessarily need to treat to a drinking water standard? Um, if, you're dispo if you're discharging, you might. You might? Have, yes. Okay. Um, Megan, this issue of treating to different levels, uh, how does that pose challenges and opportunities for R&D? And, and what, new, what new exciting frontiers do you see emerging from the science side of things? Yeah, so I think that the first frontier is actually avoiding treatment altogether or minimizing treatment. Treatment is very, very costly. It's also energy intensive and it's hard to do on the distributed scale that's relevant to most of these oil and gas operations in a place like Pennsylvania. And so the first innovation is really in being able to reuse that flow back water um, despite its high concentration of TDS. Um, there's been a lot of innovation in the formulations um, that companies have used, and um, we've moved from gel fracks, which require low divalent ion concentrations. Now, that's, that's, a lot of that's a lot of technical speak, so <laughs> gel fracks. Are you saying you put jelly in the ground? <laughs> um, it's a cross-link polymer that's used. Oh, that's much better. Thank you, there Megan. You yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first innovation is really in um, moving towards water reuse operations. Um, there's also been a lot of innovation in how you treat a high salinity brine. Um, so our lab is doing some work in um, using low temperature heat to drive membrane distillation processes. Um, we're doing some work in how to use existing reverse osmosis membrane equipment in new configurations to be able to push the upper limit of that total dissolved concentration, solid concentration beyond where reverse osmosis currently works. And then finally, I think that there's a lot of opportunity um, still yet to be tapped in really understanding um, how to uh, recover some value from these brines. Um, and there are colleagues that I have in the Civil Environmental Engineering Department um, that are doing quite a bit of work in rare earth element recovery um, from those brines. Hervé, uh, Veolia is an international company and now we're talking specifically about some of the you know, challenges and opportunities of dealing with water in the energy sector in the United States. Can you look at other countries? Or is Veolia working elsewhere in the world? And are you seeing some interesting examples or lessons that can be uh, informed the United States? Or are we really on the forefront of dealing with some of these challenges? Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of, uh, it depends the scope you take. I mean, if you take uh, uh, shale gas, Definitely, I think here is, is at the front of what's happening. If you enlarge to uh, 
wet gas, and then you enlarge to shale oil, and then, then we have seen, uh, we've seen projects uh, in, in the world, we have seen very interesting uh, projects. They're all very different. Uh, the regulations are different. The, uh, but the funny thing is the technology's base is similar, but uh, to make the process resilient, you know, small changes are very, very important. I think for me the key is, so we are in the world, there is a lot of demand in, to answer your particular question. Yeah. There is a lot of uh, interesting projects worldwide. We are also uh, working a lot in the power industry in general, you know, power plants, so we could enlarge it a little bit, but uh, uh, for shale gas, I mean, here is, uh, is really uh, where things are happening. Yeah, Hervé, you, you bring up the, the point that water and energy uh, are interconnected through, across a number of sectors, not just oil and gas, and in fact, in the United States, one of the uh, biggest revelations was when droughts come, oftentimes power plants are not able to operate at peak capacity because they utilize uh, just the existing river water, which may end up really uh, flowing at a much lower level. Yeah, New Mexico, you know right now, uh, the U.S. is amazing. So I come from North Carolina, as you can tell from I can my tell draw, by your accent, that's draw. right. <laughs> uh, there, the problem is too much water in too short time, you know, when we have, uh, but then, you know, New Mexico, and so I think in the U.S. you have these amazing problems linked to water, sometimes not enough, sometimes too much, definitely a big, big issue. Yeah, talk to Houston about uh, too much water, it can happen. Vinky, um, it has been said that the water industry is very slow-moving and not terribly innovative. And yet you've been, uh, you're leading a company that is in this space. Do you, is it, first of all, is that a fair statement or is it not quite true? And if it is true, how does a technology innovator um, be effective if the environment is slow moving? I think that uh, in general, the, the uh, um, water uh, industry is, uh, has that historical brand of being slow moving on technology. I think ultimately, we're driven by our customers' demands. We have kind of three mega trends that are going on. One is water scarcity that's been increasing, that's driving innovation. We have uh, regulation. Um, and then we have um, ultimately uh, higher purity demands from processes uh, that are driving uh, innovation demand. So more than ever today, I, as Hervé uh, referred to, I would say we're in the golden age of water technology. And, Areas such as electrochemistry, areas such as material science, areas such as uh, membranes, um, biotech, um, digitization, automation, chemistry, all converge into solutions because all of these require solutions. And kind of, I touched on automation, but today we have the issue of how we can drive automation towards um, optimization and robustness and delivering performance. These are frontiers in water that exist. So I think today, like no other, is the frontier of it's a golden age for water technology. That's great. And, and Megan, are you seeing that from undergraduates at CMU, or is the message not out yet? Do you have a line uh, around, the, around the hallway outside your office seeking to become majors in, in your discipline? Well, I see that Kaval is here uh, instead of being at class, but it's great <laughs> to see you, Kaval. Uh, I, I do see a lot of excitement, um, particularly among students that, that are interested in engaging in the research space. Um, so I think that uh, as more and more undergraduates come in with interest in, in the water space, finding um, ways to link that research to companies um, and, and to provide a path forward for them to continue innovating um, in their professional careers is really important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, here, people on this panel may, uh, are probably well aware, and maybe some of you in the audience, that Cape Town, South Africa, is uh, facing a dire crisis with respect to water supply. And I'm curious for each of you to, to share with us, uh, first of all, we all in the water industry know this issue, but what do you think the lessons are for Cape Town's situation? And um, I just want to sort of pass that question. Hervé, when I say Cape Town, you say what? Beautiful city. Yes, it is. <laughs> no, I, I think planning is very important. You know, water should not be taken for granted. Uh, we need to look at data. We need to plan. And we need to understand, in the case of Cape Town, you know, if they had planned, 
See, you cannot plan everything. You know, sometime Australia built an incredible capacity of desalination plants, which was good for the industry. And suddenly it started to rain a lot. As if, you know that's right. It was as if they made a big pile of money on the beach and it set it and on fire it and the rain. rains came from the sky. So that's yeah. a bad example. So, uh, <laughs> but I think we really need to plan to think. I think uh, also what's important, think energy. Don't think only water. It costs a lot of energy to desalinate seawater. Uh, so what about reuse? I think reuse should be definitely a big part of the, the city thinking because reuse is cheaper in terms of energy. It has less, you know, easier, in a way, cheaper. So, uh, so I think planning is definitely, and we, some of our cities have not planned enough. In the US, we know that in terms of water infrastructure, unfortunately, there hasn't been enough renewal. So the uh, underground infrastructure, which is, you know, the pipes, the uh, are totally, some of them are, are, are need change. And the budget needed to really upgrade that is, is, very, is a very big budget. So, and then think innovative. Don't think that like the old ways. Do we need these uh, mega centralized structures or do we need more decentralization and, and dispersion of, I mean, all that needs to be carefully uh, rethink. Yeah, okay. Megan, I say Cape Town, you say? I say that we really need to think about resiliency and diversification. Uh, this is a, a term that Hervé used earlier, but uh, resiliency incorporates uh, tapping a number of different sources, whether that's groundwater, whether that's surface water reservoirs, whether that's water reuse, or whether that's water desalination. Um, particularly in a changing climate when we don't know exactly how um, precipitation is likely to change um, over the next 50 to 100 years. We're likely to need to have a, a wide portfolio of water supply options uh, to be able to uh, ensure resiliency to that changing climate. Um, I say Cape Town, Venki, you say? Singapore. Tell us more. I, I say prevention through strategies similar to what S Singapore has undertaken, because they've taken up a multi-tap. You know, this is a island country that should have only focused on desalination. They focused on everything possible on water and energy efficiency, innovation. Um, they're constantly threatened by Malaysia of shutting down the tap. So, you know, they're a very, they've, they set out a very compelling blueprint for planning. Um, and it's a mix of um, trying to drive down the cost of desalination through power reduction. Um, it's, through, it's things like knee water where we change our thinking, where we, we understand. No, what's that term again? Knee water. N -E like right here, knee water? Yes, no, no K. <laughs> um, but basically it's taking uh, recycled water, whether it's industrial sewage or others, and recycling it and, you know, um, understanding that water is water, and if it's chemically uh, clear and drinkable, then you do it. So, so, so Singapore has actually pioneered direct potable reuse. That's right. Uh, do you think that that is something that the U.S. could effectively manage or even uh, emotionally accept? We, we may not be, a, that may be an eventual tap. We'd, we may not need to do that anytime soon. There are so many other things, industrial reuse, other forms of reuse, and it's, you know, the first two issues are really about optimizing reuse and the use of desalination, and then continuing down other paths. Singapore has been more aggressive. We, we can do it. There's no reason we shouldn't do it. Megan, some people complain that, that some of these water solutions like uh, desalination are just enormously energy intensive, and they have their own carbon footprint associated with them. Some people suggest that really a lot uh, of our uh, needs could be addressed simply by conservation. Do you think conservation is, uh, is, is largely an answer? Do you think they're, they're, what's the point of, of no return with conservation? Yeah, so I want to point out that there's not just a carbon footprint, but there's also air emission externalities associated with this electricity consumption, as well as chemical consumption. So we've done a lot of work to try, try to quantify that, and in many cases we find that these air emission externalities are even larger than the public health benefits of treating some of these water sources. So really, the smog is worse than the, the harm for, from the for smog some is worse. Specific than the, applications wow. um, and some specific required uh, best, uh, best, best available treatment technologies. 
um, there can be some real trade-offs in the air emission externalities associated with water treatment, especially if we're using very energy intensive water treatment processes like mechanical vapor recompression and crystallization, where you're taking water and you're basically evaporating all of that water and, and making a pure salt. Um, so we do need to think about um, what those trade-offs are, and I think that doing so in a quantitative manner helps us to make wise decisions. Um, I also think that much like in the energy efficiency space, thinking about water efficiency is likely to be the lowest cost um, and, and certainly the least impactful um, opportunity, well, the, the, most Im the least environmentally impactful opportunity um, for reducing the energy intensity um, of, of water treatment and of water supply. Um, that conservation can come through uh, retrofitting of our infrastructure systems for water delivery. Um, it's also already happened quite a bit through innovation in our appliances. Um, but there's a number of existing opportunities um, to think about conservation and, and water recycling um, that, that still need a, a lot of work. Hervé, uh, Veolia runs a number of water utilities even at the national level in some countries. Uh, in, in the energy sector, uh, we've often struggled to have our power suppliers accept and embrace energy conservation because it simply means less revenue for the power producer and they're stuck with the same amount of infrastructure and less revenue for their infrastructure. Do the same situations apply for water utilities? And if so, are there any uh, clever solutions to solving that problem? So there's two models in water utilities. There is one where the utility doesn't own the assets. So basically the utility is just an operator uh, of, of the asset. That's typically what we do in many, many cases. So in that case, the revenue, I guess, you will always probably have a bias, like you mentioned, so yes. We, uh, but I think in that case, there is also an incentive sometimes in different cities would incentivize consumption. I think it's very important to really uh, look at, uh, at this upstream reduction of usage. And then the second, second model is, okay, then we also are a capital investor in the project, so, uh, but that's not what the companies like ourselves would do, but there is also private utilities which also uh, basically put the, the money and, and own the, uh, the assets. Um, and I guess, but, but you know what, the utilities, I mean, it's again a partnership with the local cities with a region to define an agenda at a certain scale and then you push that agenda and, and the water utility is part of that agenda and then so conservation be just becomes one of the elements it's in an one overarching of the elements, water strategy yeah that is defined on a higher level on a basin level maybe on a water basin level and then you basically uh, abide by certain guidelines and you have certain incentives to, you know, to minimize that, your consumption. Yeah, Great. Uh, I'm gonna encourage audience members to, to send in some questions. We've already gotten some wonderful questions here and here's one that I, I like a lot. Uh, the audience member asked, oh, what about the use of desalination plants as a flexible load? So how can water treatment be actually used collaboratively with energy generation and energy supply. Megan, do you have any thoughts on that? I do. We should actually get my graduate student to uh, answer this question, but... He might have been the one asking the question, you never know. <laughs> you seeded it. Um, yeah, so, so I think that there are um, some trade-offs. These are typically pretty capitally intensive um, treatment plants, and so um, you don't want to overbuild water treatment capacity um, if you are uh, concerned about, um, you know, if, if you're going to be operating at a capacity factor for your water treatment facility that's only 20%, um, but you still need to supply your municipal water, uh, you know, your municipal water needs, you're not going to upsize that plant by five times. Um, so you need to think about what are the trade-offs in cap capital costs and operational costs. Um, making this a, a somewhat difficult play for a desalination plant. Um, we're doing some, some work right now, um, particularly in distribution systems, to understand um, what sort of capacity there is to um, shift the load for pumping um, and what implications that might have for uh, water quality in the distribution system as well. Um, and then I, I think the other... Um, the other piece that uh, is, is really important to think about is smaller scale, more distributed systems, um, particularly 
that have intermittent treatment needs. I mean, in those situations, I think that there's a lot more potential for um, either load balancing or use of intermittent renewable resources um, to help uh, power some of those water treatment technologies. Thank you. I want to comment on that? Sure. You know, there's, there's tremendous opportunity in hybrid uh, desalination, which involves, you know, the two, the leading technology is membrane-based desalination, but, you know, there are opportunities to hybridize them with uh, thermal desalination where you optimize waste heat from an off-taker. Uh, we believe that uh, solar is going to play a very important role in the future in driving down costs um, because desalinations or desalination plants are usually in sun-rich areas, and um, uh, those are there's there's an array of things. And with automation, the ability to optimize and balance things, it's a whole new frontier. So there's a lot of opportunities. But as I, as I said, recycling water and desalination is really the solution. But desalination has tremendous scope for optimization. Hervé, uh, you know Veolia. Do you also run power facilities? In yeah, some we no, no power facilities. We run power systems like cooling, cooling, you yeah. know, district cooling, district heating. Yeah. I have two interesting examples. One from a Swiss friend who tells me, you know, we have got you good, you guys, uh, because what they do, very interesting. You know that the power plant, you know, has excess capacity at night, depending how power is produced. If it's nuclear, you don't want to, to go up and down. So what they have done is fantastic. They bought the cheap power at night, you know what they do with it? They pump water at night, they bring water up the Alps at night, and then they resell the electricity when it's high and it's hydroelectric power. So this type of thing is possible. We also had a project where we are looking at a power plant also having excess capacity at night, and then we costed a desalination plant to do a storage, because storage of energy is the big issue, right? Energy storage. At the end of the day, it's all about energy storage. So can you use water to store energy? And how do you do that? So one way is the Swiss way, pump up. But then we are looking at desalinating water during night and then doing what is called aquifer storage and recovery. So you take desalinated water, put it in the aquifer, and then you know, you basically that's energy that you have saved. And then, uh, so there are projects, not so many, but it's, it's going to happen more and more, I think. So wait a minute, so you could, you could go to the top. Is it Mount Washington here? You could potentially put a tank at the top of uh, the hill and, and pump water up from the river in the so middle the, of the night, and then so the distance has to be small. The hill has to be steep. You know, <laughs> there are some conditions, but yeah, you can. Well, they got some steep hills here, I think. Yeah. Um, so turning now towards uh, maybe a, a closer issue. So, uh, city of Pittsburgh, I'm familiar with with their water system. It was one of the water systems that my company dealt with, and city of Pittsburgh has had a, a range of challenges over the years with um, with treating and purveying water. Uh, one was lead. A number of the uh, uh, components of the distribution system in, in Pittsburgh have lead. And uh, Hervé, uh, Veolia has, has been in operations with respect to Pittsburgh. What have, what have we learned both from the specific uh, challenges with managing Pittsburgh systems and what do we learn in general about older municipal um, water distribution systems? So I am in a global industrial division. So I have to admit I know very little about the specific uh, here. Um, and I am not well placed to talk about it, uh, more on the complex industrial projects. But uh, I think what we learn all is uh, water chemistry is very important. And so uh, in utilities, you know, we need to pay a lot of attention to that chemistry. I mean, as the infrastructure, you know, is aging, we have concrete, we have some metals, we have some, uh, and we had, a, we had a chemistry that was optimized for that. And we, I'm talking in industry, it's the same. Corrosion is a big deal. And so we have to really pay attention to, to that. But again, I cannot comment well because I've, I am not, it's a different division in operation who was involved in that sure. project. So I really, yeah. I really am not sure. Um, well, another area that affected Pittsburgh was uh, uh, issues related to the discharge of treated water from the oil and gas industry. Megan, what were some of the issues that Pittsburgh encountered there and what were their solutions? Um, so I, 
have a colleague, Jean Van Briesen, in civil environmental engineering who's done a lot of work on understanding the impacts of bromide discharges on the formation of disinfection byproducts in drinking water treatment plants. Um, and there, if you have high concentrations of chlorides and bromides, it can accelerate and en enhance the formation of um, chlorinated or brominated organics um, during the drinking water treatment process. So in other words, the, the same stuff that we use to disinfect the water to make it clean and safe for us to drink also has the potential for un unintended consequences with formation of byproducts. That's correct. Um, and we have disinfection byproduct regulations in place to make sure that those concentrations are at levels that minimize the risk to public health while still ensuring that you're getting water that does not have lots of bacteria or virus in it. Uh, but modulating and, and ensuring that you're in compliance with that regulation um, can be tough when we have low river flow conditions, um, so in the summertime when it's dry, uh, and or when there's a, a large amount of um, either cooling water from uh, power plants um, or oil and gas discharge water, both of which are high in these chlorides and bromides. So we all share the same water, and whether we like it or not, water and energy are inextricably linked. Vinky, um, the oil and gas sector has sometimes been criticized about their treatment of water, and some people have suggested that they're really is no, that, that, that water and oil don't mix, you know, that there is no conceivable way in the long run for the oil and gas sector not to damage our water sector. You're in the water treatment business for the sector. What are your thoughts? Well, I think um, those comments are usually not uh, well-founded on facts. Um, uh, the technology does exist to be able to support full environmental stewardship, and, and I think that um, the, um, producers typically um, want to um, meet environmental stewardship standards. So I think everything's there to do it. I, I do agree with Megan, and that's what's going on in, the, in, in most of the um, um, uh, plays, is that maximizing recycle at this point or reuse of water is happening. And as they progress, as Hervé mentioned, you'll continue on a continuum of technology needs that will be supported with more and more advanced technologies, especially as fields become mature. So, yeah. So, so, so it is it is well within our means to effectively treat water. Some people have been concerned about the contamination of of drinking water aquifers from produced water. Is that a serious issue in Pennsylvania? You know, I don't think so. I mean, I I think that. Uh, um, responsible treatment is out there, it's well regulated. Well, another factor is that sometimes oil and gas is produced at a far deeper level in the earth than the, than the uh, aquifers where we draw our drinking water. So there's actually some physical separation in some cases. Um, looking ahead, uh, there's a lot of innovation in uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, how do you think that those technologies are going to affect how we design water infrastructure and operate water treatment systems, Hervé? A lot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we can raise our hands, a lot. Have you seen some creative examples already or any surprises that you've seen in how those technologies can and cannot affect water treatment? Yeah, yeah no, um, I am making a presentation on that in Asia in a couple of weeks. I think uh, definitely a lot. Uh, we will need sensors. We are going to need reliable sensors because data is based on, the, on information. So we have some sensors, but we need more sensors, reliable. Uh, we have seen drones starting to be on plants. I think I can. Oh, that's so? Yeah, I, I can. I, there will be a lot. What is it going to be? The industry is asking itself. How is it going to shape our industry, in fact? Uh, um, it's, but it will, there will be changes. Other industries have been changed, and the water industry will probably be also changed by it. So, uh, yeah. Megan, are you seeing any interesting frontier areas of research for machine learning, artificial intelligence, and water? Yeah, so I think that there's actually um, lots of applications across many different scales. Um, there are applications in water resource management, understanding where there's water supply, using satellite data to understand um, things about snow cover and um, when we expect to see peak flows, et cetera. Um, there's applications at the process level 
um, ensuring that your processes are running um, at their most efficient possible um, sort of standards and, and energy efficiency, um, particularly when that comes to operating these systems dynamically, either to respond to um, variable water quality or um, changes in the required treatment volume, particularly if you did want to pair this with intermittent um, energy sources. And then I think there's also applications in um, machine learning and, and uh, advanced computational tools in terms of actually designing the materials that are going into water treatment processes. And so um, there's a number of examples here at Carnegie Mellon of people who are doing materials-based research that's leveraging um, computational uh, tools um, both to predict material properties, but also to optimize those properties. Vinky, where is sort of machine learning and artificial intelligence land in the product and technology roadmap for your company? Well, I think just taking a step back, uh, the, you know, we're still, one of the things we struggle with every day is the issues of cyber securities our clients face mm -hmm. and a willingness to share data. And there's a paradigm shift needed in, you know, the industrial water, um, technology world lives in a reactive, alarm-based culture, and we have to move to sensing and predictive diagnostics so before we can move to optimization and prevention. And, and I think that shift, along with the uh, cybersecurity challenges, will you know, open up a huge frontier. Uh, the the um, opportunity is, is vast to drive performance, but you know, we need more uh, cost-effective sensing technology and it has to be sensing the things we need. Today, the types of things we put in our systems aren't what we need to sense. So there, there's a lot of change needed at that basic level. And CMU is at the forefront of integration of uh, automation across different uh, fields, whether it be chemical engineering, material science, and computer engineering. And I think they're very well positioned. Okay. Uh, we're coming up on the end of our time, so I want to ask one final question for each of you and turn it back towards the individual. We've talked a lot about water and energy infrastructures, but ultimately water and water use comes down to people. So I'm curious, Venki, for you and your family and the future, as we continue in a world where we have more climate uncertainty, where we continue in a world where water resources may be more and more precious, what changes do you think individuals should think about in terms of their personal water use and how they interact with the world of water? Well, my, wa my wife reminds me about uh, how much water I use in my shower every day. And I tell her, well, we, we save water around the world every day. She says, it doesn't matter. And I think that type <laughs> of thinking is important as far as what we do personally because every, I think every drop counts. Megan, what do you think for the personal use in the future? I think we need to remember that a very large fraction, somewhere between 70 or so percent of our water, is actually used in the agricultural sector. So some of the, the most effective ways that you can personally change your water footprint is to change your food, food footprint. No more hamburgers? No, Peter. You're going to have to Aww. give those up. Okay. Elve? What, do you, what lessons do you take both, and maybe some lessons you've seen from other countries that have dealt with water scarcity more than the United States? No, I, I think uh, first on a personal level, I think I have three daughters. I think education is very important. Mm -hmm. I think we need to educate our young children very early on, you know, water, what is water, you know, bacteria, what is bacteria, you know, so they are not afraid of bacteria. <laughs> uh, but I think it's uh, education. Education is very important. Now, water is worldwide. Water doesn't know border, you know, evaporation and then clouds. So, uh, so I think water is also a good place to, uh, to exchange between uh, countries, between people. We have the same problems. And it's a, a ground that is a bit more neutral. So I think it's a fantastic place for pa partnerships hmm. and things like that. So I think water is... Uh, so maybe even the most contentious places on Earth right now, we can all agree to one thing, and that is... Water is an important part of our future. All right, with that, everybody, thank, I want to thank our panelists again and thank the audience for these fabulous questions, and we look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you, everybody.